This is J. Krishnamurti's fourth public talk in Madras, 1973. I believe this is the last talk. What unhappy people we are. We never seem to live happily, letting things fall from us, totally detached, not indifferent, be kindly generous, affectionate, and none of these things we seem to have, and we seem to live in great deal of unhappiness, great deal of travail, suffering, uncertainty, old age and death. We never seem to live totally, completely happy, not with things, not with ideas, not with some future hope, but never, never a mind that has never experienced despair, to live wholly all the days of our life with ease, with grace and beauty and affection. And we are going to talk this evening about meditation, won't we? This is a very serious matter. And to go into this whole question of meditation, which is so important, which is the basis of our whole life, And to go into it, one or two things must be very clear, must be made complete, so that we both of us are in communication with each other. First of all, I would like to point out In matters of the spirit, one should never follow anybody. One must be wholly and completely a light to oneself. That is the fundamental state, fundamental reality, if one wants to go very, very deeply into meditation, that there is no authority that one must be completely, totally self-reliant, which doesn't mean that one is vain, full of confidence. On the contrary, to find out what meditation is, 
there must be great sense of humility, a sense of not knowing. But unfortunately, both in this country and in other countries, this word meditation has spread. Here it is an accepted normal thing. And in Europe and America, Meditation has been imported. And the importers are rather mischievous people. They don't know what it means, but everybody is practicing meditation. Once we were walking on the beach in California, a boy and a girl in the distance. As we passed, they recognized us. They walked beside us, and presently they said, Let's sit down and meditate, if you will. And I said, What do you mean by that word? Oh, just think about things, concentrate, look at the wind and the beauty of the branch or the waves, and practice some, something which they have been told. For most of us, meditation is really something we don't know. If we could you and I, this evening, start with that. Don't let's be pretentious. Don't let's say, yes, we do know, we have practiced. We have followed a system. We want to achieve some enlightenment, some glory, some happiness, some, something beyond. And therefore we must sit quietly, close our eyes, breathe in a certain way, and so on and on and on and on. But if we could this evening, if we are at all serious, start with not knowing a thing about it. There is great beauty in not knowing. I do not know if you have ever gone into that question at all, not knowing. Not about biology and mathematics, history and archaeology and science and all that but essentially, inwardly, not knowing. And that gives to the mind a quality of great humility. <coughs> and it is only the mind that is totally humble, not in words but in actuality, it's only such a mind can understand very deeply what is involved in meditation. So if we could this evening, at all serious, put aside everything that you have heard about it, if you can, and rather doubtful, because it's become a habit. 
the puja room, the meditation room, the set, set time in the morning, in the afternoon, the evening, to shut your eyes and repeat something or other. Probably slogans, which are called mantras. If we could abandon all that and start together to see, understand, have an insight into what meditation is, then we will see that it covers the whole of life, not a part of life, but the whole of life, the whole days of our living. To go into it one must exercise reason. You exercise reason when you are earning a livelihood, when you have to do some job, when you have to carry out certain task, reason is the capacity to think sanely, logically, to think clearly, coherently. It's very important that our minds observe rationally. Otherwise, we will go along the paths of illusion, caught up in some romantic, fanciful nonsense, and then call that meditation. But if we could exercise sanity, Sanity being a perception of the whole of life, everyday life, and live a life which is meditative all the days of our life. And not to be caught in illusions, fanciful visions, we must exercise the capacity which we have when you do something or other in an office, when you want to earn a livelihood, we must exercise reason, logically, sanely, when, when we are considering spiritual matters if I can use that word spiritual without becoming rather gooey and sentimental. <coughs> so what is meditation? Don't tell me I'm asking you. If I ask you 
you will have ready answers. Learn from others, gather from books or from some guru. You have already know what meditation is. But if you don't know, and you don't know, because you are, all that you know is what you have been told, that you must meditate, you must sit this way, you will practice, do this, that and the other ten different things, you will never find out. You will never know actually the extraordinary thing that actually takes place when there is real meditation. So you have to abandon, not verbally, but actually, all that you have been told about, all that you have practiced, because there you have not exercised reason. You have only you have been led by hope, by fear, by achieving something or other which you have read about or have been told about. So you actually, in reality, don't know a thing about it. I wish you, you and I could start that way. Look, when you learn a language, you know nothing about it. You don't come to it pretentiously. You don't say, well, I have practiced, I have studied, I have this, I have that. You come to it not knowing. And you learn enormously. And if you could come to this question, not knowing a thing about it, so that your mind is fresh, eager, curious, capable of reasoning, then we can go together very, very deeply Because the word meditation means to ponder over, ponder over something, think over something, give attention, care. The word means that. And To understand the beauty of meditation, there must be space. Please listen, don't deny, accept, play with words, just listen. We said there must be space. We have no space. The world is exploding with population. If you walk down any of the streets in Madras, you will see that there is no space. People are living in small houses, huts, crowded. And that crowd, that lack of space makes people violent, irritated, angry. And equally, we have no space in our minds, in our hearts. They are crowded, filled with ideas, conclusions, beliefs, hopes, despairs, and ambitions, and so on, filled with the traditional activity, with in lot of ceremonies that are so meaningless. And 
Space is necessary. Space is necessary to reason. Space is necessary to for freedom, so that one can see something new. And having no space, the brain, if I may be a little <coughs> concerned about this matter, the brain cells you can observe it in yourself if you will i am not a, the speaker is not a professional he hasn't read a book about all these things he doesn't want to read about them because you can find out the whole of business of living and what meditation everything if you know yourself the brain cells are the storehouse of knowledge. They can add to themselves more cells in learning. And that's why the brain cells evolve. I want to go too deeply into the matter. And when the brain has no space, that is the conscious brain, and also, when we use the word conscious, there is also the unconscious. When the conscious brain has no space, then it seeks, escapes, wanting space. It needs space, we need air. And if there is no air, no space, Thought seeks out space in some belief, in some ideas, in some conclusion. You are following? So space is necessary, and space can only come about naturally when you use the mind logically, rationally, sane. and see the limits of reason. After all, rationality means the capacity to think objectively, not personally, not for personal profit, not according to a certain pattern, of belief or ideas, conclusions, but to think clearly, objectively, sanely, which means healthily, such capacity gives a great deal of security. not only outwardly, but inwardly, then you have nothing to be afraid of. You can think logically. And when we are going to this matter of meditation, which is very complex, which needs a great sensitivity to understand. And that to understand, to have an insight, the mind must be free and have space to look and not have it crowded. In meditation, <coughs> we 
we are seeking something. The ordinary meditation that you all practice. I don't know why you practice it, that's what you do. <coughs> you are seeking something. You want something. Your desire, your will directs it. So your meditation is a directive process. It's a, it has direction. You. Now, who has set the direction? You are following this? Please give your mind to this little bit. If you, when you sit down, close your eyes and meditate, you have set a course, you have set a direction, there is a, a purpose, an intention, a will operating. Have you noticed all this? So in meditation, as you practice it, please forgive me when I say you, this is what is generally happening. I'm not separating myself, but I'm just pointing it out. When you meditate, you have set a course of action, set a direction. Now who is the person who has set the direction. Your own desire, obviously. Your own hope, your own ambition to achieve Godhead, whatever it is, enlightenment, uh, you know, all the things that are put before you as an enticement. So you have set a cause, and when you set a cause you must follow it, and to follow it you must keep on, repeat, repeat, repeat. You are following? That means there is a controller and the control, when you have a direction, contrary to all your activities, you are following all this. <coughs> when in meditation you have set a cause which is contrary to your daily living, your daily living being, ambition, greed, um, corruption, uh, lustful, uh, competitive, cheating, lying, uh, seeking power, vanity – that's your daily life. And in meditation you have set a course which is contrary to your daily life. Don't fool yourself, that's a fact. And this you call meditation which is so utterly irrational, has no meaning. So we have to examine very closely why the mind, why you, have given a direction in meditation, when you have not given a direction, when you have given directions, so many directions in daily life. You Are you Am I making myself clear? And therefore, being contrary to your daily living, control becomes necessary. Controlling your thoughts, controlling your desire in order to achieve what you think is reality. 
control. Control your body, control your breath, control your uh, verbal slogans, control your mantras, your slogans, and and so on. Control, control, control. You control in daily life your sexual appetites, you try to control them, but you fail. You try to control your anger, you try to control con- all through life. Our, we are educated to control. Have you noticed it? Your life. And meditation has become a super control in order to achieve a super consciousness. And therefore, where there is control, you lose energy. You understand? And you need tremendous energy to go into this question of meditation. So the first thing is no following of anybody, including that of the speaker. Don't follow him. Don't repeat what he says or anybody says, your guru, your books, or your tradition, because you have to be a light to yourself in a world that is going dark, that is disintegrating, that is becoming more and more corrupt. And you have to understand this question of control. So you have to ask, is there a way of living, not in abstraction, but daily, whether you can live daily, every day of your life, without a single control? You understand what I am? Your immediate response to that probably is, then we will do what we want. Our desires will just get lost. But you are lost, aren't you? You are confused. You are living a messy, shoddy, shallow life anyhow. But we have to understand this question of control. The speaker has never controlled about anything, right? You don't have to accept, but I'll, I'll show you the reason logically, sanely, healthily, objectively, how it is possible to live without a single control, (coughs) if you are interested. Because then you have tremendous energy. (coughs) A motor, an engine, wears out through friction. And the mind, the brain, wears itself out through friction, which is loss of energy, dissipation of energy. (coughs) And control implies a controller and a thing controlled, and therefore there is a conflict. You follow? And that conflict is a dissipation of energy. So let us find out if it is possible to live without control.
bearing in mind that you are conditioned to control from childhood to school, college, university, in your offices, throughout life, control has been the tradition, the normal process of life. Here somebody comes along and says, how wasteful you are, how destructive you have become through your controls. And your reaction is, what nonsense are you talking about? How can we live without any control? Then we'll be sexual, we'll be amb- we will do everything that we are doing now, only more consciously. So you're frightened. I will show you a way, not I, we will, show. we will look together at this question. Can a life be led in the office, in the factory, in the school where the tragedy begins? Whether a teacher can teach without ever using the word or feeling control, whether you can live a life, daily life, not an abstract life but a daily routine, the daily business of life, whether you can live there without control. Please listen. See the importance that energy is wasted through control, through friction, and there is friction when there is a controller and a control. If if there is no division between the controller and the control, then there is no friction. We follow you. This is probably a new language to us, new way of looking at it. So please look at it with patience. Look at it as though, you know, something you are hearing which may be pleasant and which you may reject, but look at it. Enjoy looking at it. Be happy looking at it. Not raising a problem, how shall I live without control? (coughs) The main thing in control is the dissipation of energy through friction. And life demands that you have every ounce of energy to live completely, wholly. Now, first of all, who is the controller who is all the time exercising his authority to control? Who is the controller? Is he different from the control? Think, look at it carefully, feel your way into it. I can, the controller says, I must control thought in order to be silent. That's one of your tricks. The controller is at is trying to hold his thoughts, right? Control, holding, and thoughts gone wrong, and you pull them back, and that's battle goes on. And you think by controlling you will achieve some God knows what. 
Now, who is the controller? Isn't he also the part of your thought that goes off, that wanders off? Look for up. I sit down, meditate, close my eyes. I never do that kind of silly tricks. I close my eyes and I want to concentrate. And suddenly I see a thought wandering off. I say to myself, I ought to have cleaned my shoes. No, no, just me. And a part of another thought says, No, don't bother, come back. Don't think about your shoes, come back and be thoughtful now about thinking, about something you want to think about. And you control it for a few seconds. And then thought goes off and says, I ought not to have said that to that person. And back again. You follow? Who is the controller? Is he not part of this wandering form? Are you seeing this? Huh? Do you see this? I put it ten different ways. If you see it, I won't. Right? Is it clear? That the controller is part of the thought that is wandering off. So the controller is the control. Do you see that? It's part of this movement of thought. And the controller says, I must control thought. He himself is thought. That is reason, <laughs> saying, objective. So, if the <coughs> If you observe, if the mind observes the controller is the control, then the division between the controller and the control disappears. Therefore, you have energy to deal with the thought that goes off. Listen to this carefully. I'm sitting quietly in my room, trying to be quiet, trying my mind, the mind trying to be quiet. I want a peace of mind. That's what you all want, a peace of mind. Do you understand? <laughs> I'm glad you laugh. And sitting quietly, suddenly a thought arises. I dislike that man. Immediately my reaction is I'm meditating, I must be kind, I mustn't think of disliking the poor chap, and I must control. Now, I dislike him. Why? He said something to me which I don't like. He insulted me. The past, please listen to this, the past which has not been resolved comes at the moment of quietness and flowers. 
you you understood at the moment of quietness my dislike of that man or that woman takes shapes and becomes a reality now that is the past in the present flowers and i control it thought controls it which means i have smothered it therefore it occur again no no so i say thought wanting to be quiet thought brought this out of the past and i try to smother it I smother it, and then another thought arises, and I go on like this, spend twenty minutes playing this game, and I have meditated. Now, the dislike of that person took place in the past, and I am sitting quietly in the room. Sitting quietly under the tree in the roof on the beach, and suddenly that is like flowers in the present. Let it flower. You've understood. The m- moment you are aware that is flowering, it withers away. But if you control it, it you give in life to it. Have you understood this simple fact? Look, sir, do it. The mind, for the moment, is quiet. That quietness is the present. It may last. Two seconds, but that's the present. In those two seconds, a, f- a thought flowers, comes into being from the past. We generally put a lid on it, suppress it, control it, let it blossom. But be aware that it is blossoming. Give your care, attention to the flower. Of this life, <laughs> you understand, and you will see what takes place. In that, there is no control whatsoever. Have you understood this simple fact? So, in the same way, every day of your life, every minute of your life, what? If you are tired, let go. But next minute, watch. Be quiet. Let let things come out and let them flower. And in the flowering of it is the ending of it. If you don't want to shape it, control it, justify it, just to observe it. Have you, got, have you understood this? <coughs> Not verbally, but in actually in your blood. So, in meditation, there is no control whatsoever. <laughs> totally contrary to everything that you know. In meditation, there is no direction. Please understand this. How do you know where you are going? You know where you are going in daily life. You take the road to go to your home. You know the direction. You know the direction in the office. The office 
on the factory, you have to do certain things in order to get more money, climb the ladder of success and all the rest of it. So you know the direction. You are following all this, do please. And do you know in meditation where you are going? Who has set the direction? The direction is peace of mind. Your mind is in pieces anyhow, so you want a little piece of that pieces. No, no, please, do see all this. Who has set the direction? Your guru, your masters, your books? Other people's experiences? Yes, I know I've reached God. I know all about God and I tell you what to do. <laughs> so somebody has set your direction or you have set the direction, right? Logically, watch it, logically. This room demands reason, not superstition that you are all living in. All the rituals that are superstitious, they have no meaning. So, direction means a fixed point, right? I know the direction from this place to the place I live, because that house is fortunately fixed. Now, you say enlightenment, truth is fixed. Therefore there is a direction. But you never inquire if truth has a fixed point. You understand? Is enlightenment something like a tree fixed, taking a root somewhere? Or is it a living thing, therefore moving? Therefore no direction, therefore no power. Do you understand? If you see that, then there is no system. You understand, sir? No method, no practice. See what you have done? And there is no control. No practice. No system to be followed. No slogan, slogans repeated as the mantras, all for a direction which is fixed. If there is no fixed point, then there is no need for practice. That means the whole movement of desire as will comes to an end in meditation. You understand? The, the freedom from will, which is the concentration of desire, totally come, must come to an end as directed in meditation. You. So the mind has no control. It is no longer caught in a routine of meditation, practicing, practicing, repeating. Have you ever been to any of these gatherings where they worship some idiotic person? Repeat his name or Ram, Ram, Sita, Go, Go, and whatever they repeat, and mesmerize themselves into some kind of idiotic state and say they are religious. This is what you are doing. That's nothing to do with religion. It's hypnosis but through idea, through words. 
So the mind is no longer direct, and there is freedom of will. Therefore, there is great space. And is it necessary to sit in a certain way, to breathe in a certain way, to keep your eyes closed? Is all that necessary? When you don't do it in daily life, why do it here? You understand, you are living in different departments, utterly unrelated to each other. You are crooked in one way in your business, in your politics, in your whatever you are doing, corrupt, and uh, try to be moral and be immoral, and sexual, trying and trying to be chaste, and in meditation. So you live in sections, in departments, all contradicting each other, and that is the very essence of corruption, not passing money on the desk. So when you have understood the nature of control, there is no direction, then why sit in a particular way? It is obviously physically necessary to sit straight, where you, sit, you know, blood goes more to the head and all that business. I'm going to. You can, if life is a, if life is the whole movement of meditation, daily life, not just sitting in a corner and having a little peace of mind. But the whole of life is a movement in meditation. Then you live freely every minute of your life. And when you are meditating, when this meditative process is going on, there are certain powers you have, naturally, powers of healing, and if you are unfortunate enough to perform some miracles, all these things take place, of which the speaker knows something about which doesn't mean he's vain about it, he's just stating it. But there are many people in the world who are producing miracles, right? You have seen them, probably you all go to them, miracle mongers. And how a human mind, like a reason mind, can go to that kind of childish performance is unthinkable. A religious person completely denies all that. Yes, sir, that's not religion, worshipping a person, doing a puja to somebody who does some kind of idiotic miracles. You're all very silent. Probably you go to them, don't you? (laughs) 
and you don't see how extraordinarily childish it is. When the house is burning, you go and do, worship a person. You understand what I'm telling you? Caught in miracles, when your whole house is afar. Are you, are you listening to all this? <coughs> and next problem and question in meditation is what is science? Why is it necessary for the mind to be silent, not at peace? That's a dreadful word to use in meditation. When you're in your daily life, you're not peaceful. In your daily life you are violent, ambitious, greedy, envious, anxiety, fearful. And you want peace. So, as in daily life you have no peace, don't seek in meditation peace. That has no meaning. That's just pretension. It's like my talking about not being corrupt, put it, having my hand in another man's pocket. So what is science and why is it necessary for the mind to have completely quiet, silent mind? Please ask, find out, sirs. Why should you have a silent mind, a really quiet mind, a mind that's not occupied with God, with uh, unhappiness, with, with your job, with your wife, husband, a quiet, unoccupied, totally silent mind? Why should you have it? Do you listen to that dog? Wait, wait, silently. Listen to it completely silent, which means without any resistance, without any irritation. Just listen. When you listen quietly, there is no resistance. There is no irritation. You do not identify yourself with the dog and the barking of it. Your, your mind is quiet. Now, when you are listening, I hope, as you are listening to the speaker, <coughs> to hear what he is saying, your mind must be quiet. That's ordinary courtesy, ordinary politeness, and ordinary rational necessity if you want to listen to what the speaker is saying. So, acquired. Silent mind is necessary to listen. To see something, a tree, to see some uh, the movement of the breeze and the leaves, you have to look. And if your mind is not looking wholly, then you can't look. You understand? So, quiet mind and a silent mind are necessary. 
a mind that is not filled in with words, with ideas, with speculations, conclusions, fears, a mind must be silent without any invitation. You understand this? If you invite silence, it's not silence, is it? Do you see do you see this? I've heard you you say to me only when you are silent you can hear the dog. When your mind is quiet you can see the leaves moving. So I've I've heard that. And I want to see the three leaves moving, so I practice to, to be silent. And such practice of silence is no silence, is death. And that's what has taken place with all of you. You are dead people. Because you are second-hand people. You repeat endlessly what others have said and perform puja, rituals, glory, and your life is utterly unhappy, as therefore meditation is all through the whole days of our life. And when there is order, which is virtue, a behaviour which is not contradictory, which is whole, then a mind it's completely quiet, completely still, without direction, without control. Such a mind has immense energy, because in it there is no friction, and then only Because, please listen, because in space there is no direction, there is no time. Have you understood it, sir, somebody? There is space between here and the place I live. To get from here to there, in that space, time is necessary. Right? Time to practice. Time is necessary. But when there is in space, there is no direction, there is no time. Oh, get this, please. Therefore, in that space, there is only the present. And time then is mere physical fact. Catch a train, catch a bus, go from here, there, and so on. But when there is no controller under control, when there is no direction, space is beyond the content of consciousness. No, you don't understand, don't agree, don't shake, nod your head in agreement, you don't understand this. <coughs> you know what consciousness is? 
conscious. You are conscious, aren't you? you when you when you are hurt, you become conscious of your hurt, of your or when you are enjoying something tremendously, you are conscious that you are. Your consciousness contains the consciousness is its content, right? Don't learn this. Observe it. Now, the content of consciousness is ambition, violence, greed, envy, power seeking, power position, uh, cheating, corrupt. All that is the content of your consciousness, as your furniture, as your house, as your name. That's the content. In that content. We move. All thought moves. That is, thought is the movement of the known. The movement of the known is time. Now, in meditation, the there is the complete emptying of the mind of the known. The known is the me. You Have you ever thought, must I go into all this? So you can know yourself very well, can't you, if you applied your mind, your greeds, your envies, your purposes. Your attachments and detachments and the fears and the pleasures, the past experience, remembrances, your the memories are the known. Right? The known is the me, isn't it? The me is the content of my consciousness. It's very simple, don't complicate it. You don't have to study sad books about this. You can see it yourself. My consciousness is my struggles, my conflicts, my uh, purposes, my technique, my talent, my desires. That's my, the content of my consciousness. All thought is within the boundaries of that consciousness. And in meditation, when you come to the real beauty of it, the depth is the freedom from the totally known, though operating in the known. Ah, you won't get this as bad. So, in that quality of mind, time has come to an end. Thought is not projecting anything. Therefore there are no visions, no gods, no nothing. That nothingness is not emptiness. That nothingness is the creative flowering of life, of total life. That is the very essence of something that is unnamed. But you but the mind cannot come to it with any kind of will, with any kind of desire, with through any kind of ritual, slogans, mantras and ramas and sitas and God knows what else. It can only come when you lead a righteous life, now, not tomorrow, every day of your life. When there is no friction between you and another, that is, when you have relationship with another, not through your images, but relationship. And when you have 
this immense feeling of compassion, love, that is beauty. You know, that is there as, in, as a root, as a tree has its root deep in the earth, unless your feet are firmly in there, unshakable. Then you, then out of in that out of that grows the beauty of silence, which is not cultivable, which is timeless, and therefore something beyond all words. <coughs>